Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we have our fourth lecture on the reform era and we are going to be taking a look at how uh, the negative impacts of industrialization were, were happening for real people. Uh, we're going to take a look at farmers, we're going to take a look at workers, we're going to see how uh, the Industrial Revolution was changing life for them, both for the good and the bad, okay? So let's go ahead and jump right into it. Let me get the lecture going here. So we're going to start by taking a look at farmers. Now, at this time in our nation's history, most people were still farmers, okay? It will not be until the early 20th century that we start to see a major shift away from farming. Most people had their jobs tied to farming in some cases. Now, the Industrial Revolution is what is changing that, okay? With the rise of factories and industrial jobs, we are seeing people move out of the countryside and into the cities to try and find more stable income. Now, farmers were affected in other ways as well. As the Industrial Revolution started creating machines that allowed for more work to be done in a shorter amount of time, farmers adapted to that as well. Of course, John Deere tractors, the, famous, the most famous tractor in the world. Okay, we're going to start seeing you know, mass production of farming equipment that is going to uh, result in things like oxen and horses that have been used for literally millennia to, uh, for, to farm fields. We're going to see them being substituted out for uh, a tractor. A tractor can, uh, can harvest a lot more crops than a horse can in, uh, in a lot less time. And uh, you know the tractor can keep going, whereas the horse may need rest after a while. So farming during the Industrial Revolution Revolution really begins to change. Now, for the farmers themselves, they started running into other problems. Although they had the benefit of new machinery, they did have other issues that they were having to deal with. And I've listed some of those. It became more difficult to charge high interest rates, um, or excuse me, it, it became more difficult to sell crops overseas. The Industrial Revolution is not just happening here. The Industrial Revolution is happening elsewhere. And what that means is other farmers throughout the world are becoming more efficient as well. And so that is having a negative impact on American farming. Banks are charging high interest rates. Okay, so to take out loans on these tractors and, and farmland, the banks are charging higher and higher rates. They're getting their cut and taking more and more of it. Railroads, you know, farmers, uh, once you harvest your crop, you have to get it to market. Well, by this point, railroads became the main way in which that was being done. And uh, of course, every time you ship something on the railroad, it's not free. You have to cut them uh, a bit. So, you know, everybody's taking a little bit from the farmers. And what we're seeing is that their income overall is starting to decrease a little bit. Finally, the government is also negatively impacting farmers as well because the government is increasing the money supply. We're going to talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. But uh, the uh, money supply is being messed with at this time, and it's going to lead to some inflation. Now, let me get the next slide going. All right, so a couple of terms that you need to know from, from here on out. Number one, tariffs. Now, tariffs have entered the public lexicon more so in the last four years with uh, President Trump uh, and his administration pushing tariffs as a way to uh, try and make up, um, you know, some of the, um, uh, you know, taxes, basically. Well, uh, a tariff, simply put, is a tax on an import. So every single item, you know, and sometimes this is applied to very specific items, uh, like Trump's tariffs have been, you know, specifically on things like electronics or uh, aluminum, okay? So tariffs can be applied either generally or they can be applied to specific items. Now, at this time period we're talking about, tariffs were the main way that America was making its money excuse me, main way the government was making its money. There is no such thing as the income tax yet. That'll change with a constitutional amendment in the early 20th century, but most of the, the government's money was coming in through tariffs, a tax on an import. Now, don't be confused, though. The people selling that good, those other foreign countries aren't necessarily the one paying it, okay? It's the people that are buying the good here. So now, anytime you buy, say, a refrigerator, you know, you may be paying 10% more than you would, uh, you know, a few years ago when those tariffs were not in place. So a tariff is a tax on the import, and the American people are the ones that pay that. 
The design, though, the purpose of this was to try and protect a nation's own industry. So let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, uh, we were in the business of making pencils, okay? Let's say that we made pencils and uh, we had these factories, but uh, all of a sudden these these pencils coming from Germany were, were much cheaper, right? They were 20% cheaper than the pencils we were making here. Now, it might be the exact same quality, might uh, even be a little better, but people are starting to buy up German pencils because uh, it's cheaper. Well, if we put a tariff on German pencils and put a 20% tariff on it, now all of a sudden that rate is now the same, right? So you can choose to either buy an American pencil or you can choose to buy a German pencil. And in some case, the tariff would even make that item more expensive. So, you know, if you have your choice between buying a $2 pencil from Germany or a $1 pencil from America, most people are going to buy the American product. So, tariffs are a tax on imports and they are placed on goods to make them more expensive to, to try and get people to buy American. In 1888, this was put into practice with the McKinley Tariff, named after the senator who wrote it, uh, who would later be president and would actually be assassinated here in the next uh, 10, 15 years. Now, the McKinley Tariff raised uh, these tariffs significantly and really across the board. And here's where the rub comes, okay? Tariffs on their own aren't necessarily a bad thing. It's good to support, you know, a nation's uh, own economy and all that. But here's the problem. Once we put that tariff on German pencils, don't you think Germany is watching that? And what do you think they're going to do once we put a tariff on them? Well, that's right. They're going to turn around and put a tariff on our goods. That's exactly what happens, and it's what happens every single time. That is one thing that uh, the Trump administration has run into. So when we put tariffs on all these Chinese goods, well, that's fine. You know, people may buy more American, that, and that's good. But net, is it actually beneficial? Because China turns right around, and they put a tariff on our goods, okay? So especially items that they get from us. In particular, I know for a fact that soybeans, okay, they put a tariff on our soybean production. So yeah, people might be buying more American steel, but they're not buying, um, you know, China is no longer buying our soybeans. So, you know, we have to look at kind of the overall net benefit. Uh, is it something that has increased America's strength uh, or is it some, something that has helped out certain industries while hurting other industries. So, you know, this is an example of, of the government getting involved, uh, not necessarily free market economics here. This is something that is they're trying to, to slow down and, and, and put their, uh, uh, you know, interact to try and get people to buy a certain way. Now, uh, the McKinley tariff will lead to some major problems. And we'll talk about uh, not only this one later on, but another tariff that Frankly, we're on the road to World War I at this point. I mean, World War I is less than 20 years out, and what we're going to start seeing over the next 20 years is things like tariffs are going to completely halt the global economy. And once the global economy stops, people, especially uh, you know, countries that are dependent on exportation, they are going to become... Uh, how do I put it, uh, frankly, more frisky. And uh, they're going to try and find other ways to make money. And eventually, we're going to start seeing nations invading one another. So uh, this is one of the root causes right here, economics, uh, which is often the cause uh, for many wars. The final term on this page, uh, inflation. Okay, And I mentioned inflation on the last slide, but we didn't define it. A decline in the value of money. Now, this can be caused by a number of different things. And in this scenario, what we're talking about is an increase in the supply of money without an increase in goods. Let me give you an example that describes inflation. Now, let's say that we are all sitting in, in my classroom and that um, all of a sudden we go on lockdown, okay? And let's say it's right before lunch. Well, it turns out that everybody was planning to buy their lunch that day except for one person. Okay, and that person pulls out a, uh, a large pepperoni pizza, all right? This is the only food in the classroom, and you have 30 hungry students. Well, let's say this lockdown lasts for maybe an hour, maybe two hours, maybe all day. Now, how much do you think that student could sell that pizza for? Maybe they paid $10 for it. Well, you think they could sell it for in a room of hungry people? 40 50 I don't know. Now, let's say that the opposite scenario, okay? We go into lockdown, 
But instead of just one person pulling out a large pizza, every student in the classroom pulls out a large pizza. Now, do you think that that same student is going to be able to get 40 or $50 for that pizza anymore? No, because the supply is high. Now, it's the same pizza, all right? So what has made the difference? Well, the difference is supply and demand, right? The demand is not as much because everyone has a pizza in the second scenario. The supply is higher, okay? Therefore, the value of that pizza has decreased. Well, what was happening here was that the money supply was going up, but the amount of goods, the increase in goods was not happening. So what that means is that the money was worth less. We don't often think about the fact that there is really a finite amount of money being printed, right? I don't know what that number is, but there is a finite amount. You could calculate it if you had all the money stacked up, right? What we're saying is that the government was printing off more money leading to inflation, meaning that the money was not buying as much. There was too much of it, and it was not buying as much materials and goods. Now, we're going to move away from economics for a little bit. This is our final section of part one. We're going to be looking at some of the moral issues that were happening in America. Morals are changing. They always change over time. And what we're seeing is, especially as uh, new inventions are being introduced to our lives, people have uh, more emphasis on, on different parts of their lives. And it changes how we, uh, what we view as important. So the mass culture entirely is changing. Uh, you know, this is our, that, that path that is leading us down the road to uh, the Kardashians. So I, I curse this generation. But uh, just kidding. Uh, not really. Uh, so the, the changing mass culture, what we're seeing is that entertainment is becoming a much more important part of people's lives. And part of this deals with uh, some of the other changes we'll talk about later on, including a, a smaller work week and, uh, and more money. Eventually, things like minimum wage allow for people to have more spending money. Um, but people are uh, buying things like magazines, they're, they're going to movies, they're going to uh, sporting events, and they are, they are focusing more on entertainment. This is the emergence of the entertainment industry right here. Before, people just didn't have time or money for it. So recreation also becomes uh, a much bigger deal. Automobiles allow people to travel farther than ever before. They're able to visit states and locations that they never would have before. You know, most people uh, up until this period never traveled outside of about 10 miles uh, from their house. Okay, well, that is starting to change now with the railroads. Now with automobiles, people are able to spend more time uh, traveling and uh, with recreation. Consumerism. Okay, this is a term that uh, definitely applies today, probably more so than ever before. But what we're seeing in the early 1900s is an increased focus on consumerism. Advertising is becoming a major industry. How, how companies are selling their goods. You know, there becomes a whole science tied to the psychology behind selling people goods. You know, you have to make it appealing, even if it's a bad product. Okay, so people are buying more things than ever before. Part of that is because of the mass marketing that is taking place. I have a picture there of uh, one of the, the first Sears robot catalogs. Now, of course, Sears today is, is really struggling. In fact, the, the Sears locally here in town just shut down within the last few years. Sears as a whole is struggling because uh, even though they had been on the cutting edge in the late 1800s, uh, they've fallen behind over the last century. Okay? What made them cutting edge in the late 1800s was they made it easier than ever before for people to buy things. Okay? Instead of going all the way down to your local grocer who has a finite amount of goods, now all of a sudden you could open up one of Sears catalogs and you could order anything from a hat to a, a gun to a car, even a house. You could actually buy a house through the Sears robot catalog and they would ship all the materials to you in order for you to build that house. I'm not even kidding you. I think there's, so I think Indiana has, uh, has, has thousands of these houses that have been created uh, cookie cutter shapes, but uh, uh, they still exist today. So uh, I guess before I get off that topic, you know, I, I, I mentioned that Sears is kind of dying today. Uh, you know, they, they were so innovative here where they, uh, you know, people could easily buy their products. But what has revolutionized shopping over the last 30 years? The Internet. Sears didn't keep up with that. They had those big box stores and uh, they missed out on that innovation of people making it, 
you know, making it even easier for people to buy goods through the internet. So, you know, all that, uh, all that consumerism that, uh, you know, people buying things from Sears, now all of a sudden they're buying them from Amazon because it's easier. So uh, whatever you do, if you go into business, try to find something that makes it easier for people to buy stuff. And once you make your first million, give me a cut of it for giving you the idea. All right. Now, also along this moral uh, idea is that there, there are a lot of problems going on in society that are often behind closed doors. And frankly, alcohol abuse is something that has affected American society from our very beginning. But uh, during the Industrial Revolution and on, even to today, uh, where frankly alcoholism is often you know, almost celebrated, um, the fact is a lot of society uh, was blaming alcohol for some of the failures, right? Uh, if you've ever read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle, you know, a lot of these workers in these factories would get their paycheck on Friday and they would go to the bar and they would spend all of it on, uh, on basically getting drunk. Uh, and, you know, often that leads to problems at home, domestic violence, things like that. So people are starting to kind of zero in and say that if we could get rid of alcohol, we would get rid of all these other problems. Well, we'll see if that actually works. Finally, we're going to look at what's happening with the workers of this country, the, the labor and the working conditions, because as I've mentioned in previous lectures, things are not necessarily going well for the workers. Now, the people on top, the bosses, the, the, the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts of the world, things are going great for them. But the workers that are actually making it all happen, their situation tends to get worse. I mean, there were no protections for workers at this time. If you lost an arm in a meat grinder, I'm sorry, but you're fired because you're bleeding all over the floor. Now go find another job. Um, today, there are more regulations in place to make things safer. There's also things like minimum wage to help us out, but that's the second part of this unit. Today, we're just focusing on some of the problems. So uneven division of income. Those rich Vanderbilt, Rockefeller people getting wealthier and wealthier, whereas the workers are getting poorer and poorer. Child laborers. Uh, this is one of the saddest parts, I think, of the unit. Uh, you know, you look at the picture of these kids, and uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I was not having to do hard manual labor when I was seven, eight, nine years old. But the fact is, it was legal at this time to hire children, and frankly, they were wanted to work in these factories because they could start as early as age seven, and with their little fingers could often get in machines that, uh, you know, grown adults would not be able to uh, fix. You don't have to pay kids as much, right? Uh, so, you know, they, they were, for some industries, they were very appealing. This is obviously a major problem, okay? It's not good for children to be in a workplace because every minute that they spend in a factory is a minute that they are not in school. And so you are actually making dumber and dumber generations uh, that are not going to be able to fix these scenarios unless you get children out of the workforce. By 1810, and that's pretty early, but uh, by 1810, there were about 2 million kids that were working, 50 to 70 hours per week, okay? An average work week today is 40, okay? Unless you're a teacher, and then it's back up to the 50 and 70. In fact, looking at these stats, I'm seeing six days a week for a dollar. You know, there's, there's, this is basically, you know, teacher's income. But uh, anyways, 2 million children were working about 50 to 70 hours per week. And uh, what you have is a very... Uh, negative impact on uh, on ability to improve their lives because uh, education is the key. If they can't read or write, um, it makes it very difficult to improve their lives later on. Also, also health and safety codes. This is applying to workers. Uh, frankly, there were not safety precautions uh, that were being taken place. So, um, you know, today you go through a factory, you'll see signs, you'll see safety, uh, you know, um, you know, They'll put up uh, a guard on a machine that's very sharp. You know, there's safety codes in place. You can't have so many people in a, in a room because of fire codes. Those don't exist at this time. In 1911, we had one of the worst factory um, incidents that, that had ever taken place. Uh, a small country uh, factory called the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory uh, was located in New York, and it mainly hired young women to work as seamstresses, um, sewing uh, what were called shirtwaist, a very common dress for a woman at the time. Uh, the, the bosses, um, they would, as was their normal practice, the managers would uh, basically, once people got there for the day, they, they locked the doors and they were locked from the outside. 
One day, a fire broke out, and as you can imagine in a textile industry like this, uh, with a lot of cloth laying around, a fire spread quite rapidly. With the doors being locked, and by the way, there's no regulations for the building either, so there's no fire escape. Uh, these young women, over a hundred young women, had to make the ultimate choice, uh, do I burn to death or do I jump and kill myself? Uh, 145 young women um, had to make a, a horrible, horrible decision on how to end their life. Uh, the owners ended up escaping all charges, and mainly because, according to really the law, they hadn't broken any laws. And that's when society woke up and said, this is a problem. Okay? There's, there's a time and place for laissez-faire capitalism, but there is a time and place for regulation as well. It should be illegal to lock the doors from the outside in a place where a fire might erupt. It is, uh, should be illegal to overcrowd a factory. Uh, they, these are, there should be a fire escape on buildings. People are starting to wake up and say, perhaps we need some regulation to make sure there's a certain level of safety provided for workers. I hate to end it on that moment, but uh, the fact is, uh, these are some of the issues that uh, were, were dominating the headlines at the time, and, and finally people are waking up saying, we can do better, all right? Next time we get together, we're going to take a look at some of their ideas on how to make those problems better, and we're going to journey into part two, reforming the problems. Thanks again for tuning in. Shoot me an email if you have any questions, and I'd be happy to get back to you.